Fire Station community. My name is Alexandra and today I'm going to talk a little bit about the creative process of my last artwork which you can find in my Art Station page. In this video you will find a quick breakdown on the steps I follow when starting a new project and tips that I've learned on how to develop a stylized piece as well as information that could be useful for you and your next project. Step 1. References and concept art. The first thing that I want to talk about is the pre-production of my project. In this case, I decided to translate Julia Kovalyova's concept art East Bridge. Please be sure to check it out in her profile as well as all her work. I chose this concept because I love the contrast of red and blue colors. I also love all the different kinds of foliage. When I'm searching for a concept, I usually look for two things. First, something that makes me excited when I look at it. And second, something that I can take as an opportunity to learn something new. Something exciting for me personally means cute and colorful environments, but you can find excitement in fantasy, sci-fi, horror, witchcraft, or even realism. Find a topic that feels like something you would want to see in a game or movie that suits your taste. It's been a while since I wanted to add animation to my scenes and I wanted to learn how to use the Unity Node system. So this concept felt like a perfect opportunity to implement both. After I chose my concept, I like to search for other resources that fit my project and then create a document with all those images. This way I can come back from time to time to them and get inspired. Step 2. Grey box and blocking. I know from my experience that sometimes starting a new project might feel overwhelming. So what I like to do after having a solid base of references is to recreate the big shapes and silhouettes of what I'm working on. I use cubes or really low poly spheres and sometimes other primitives, but keeping in mind that this is just to measure the proportions and work with the big shapes. At this stage I can start visualizing how I'm going to arrange the materials, which ones will need transparency and how many meshes I will use. I usually bring these shapes into Unity or the engine that I'm going to render my final piece to give them flat colors. Inside Unity, I import the reference of a human. In this case, because this is a stylized piece, I use stylized proportions as well, just to have a reference of how someone would look when walking across the bridge. This step shouldn't take too long and I try not to overthink too much the things that are missing. Step 3. Sculpting. Once I'm happy with the quick thumbnail of my project, I can start adding detail. This step is different for each mesh, but what I usually do is to import into ZBrush the FBX file that I want to add detail to, then dynamesh it, then sculpt cracks and trim hard edges. I also sculpt specific detail like wood patterns and rock textures. I keep coming back to my references for an accurate approach to silhouette and shapes. Step 4. UVs and Texel Density It's important that all my images have textures with accurate resolution. There are some really good plugins and other tools to have proper Texel Density. But for this piece, I proceed to create a plane of 400 by 400 for the bridge and basically anything that doesn't need transparency, and another one of 200 by 200 for the foliage. Then I make sure that all the UVs of my project fit inside this space. If they doesn't, I have to create another map. In this example you can see how I need another map for the big rocks. By the time I reach this step, I already made sure that I'm working in centimeters and even though my proportions are stylized, they could also exist in the real world. I create the UVs for all my meshes, trying to be as efficient as possible. 
I can show you the bridge as an example. The UVs are overlapping because the mesh is mirrored and shares the information of the texture in both sides. This way, I fit the information of two sides in one space. Step 5. Baking maps. There is already a really good tutorial for this step by Fanny Byrne, which I highly recommend. But still, I'm going to quickly talk about how I use the baking tool inside Marmoset Toolbar to transfer the detail of my sculpt to the low poly version of my meshes. I started by giving all my meshes names inside Maya that both the high poly and the low poly versions share. For example, for this rock I used small rock and the suffix underscore high for the high resolution version, and then small rock underscore low for the low resolution version. I do this for all my meshes and then import them into Marmoset with the quick load tool which will arrange my meshes according to the names that I gave them before. I usually bake as many maps as I can because I like to play with the blending modes inside Photoshop and sometimes different maps can create unexpected results that improve the final texture. But really, the ones that I end up using the most are the green channel of the normal map, the curvature map and the ambient occlusion map. Step 6. Blending modes. Once I have my maps baked, I export a UV image of the UV editor inside Maya and import it into Photoshop. I create one folder for each material and mask it using the lasso tool with my UV image from Maya as a reference. It really helps if at step 4 I carefully place my UVs so that all UV islands from one mesh are close to each other. Inside each folder, I add a flat color that corresponds with the colors I chose in the blocking stage, and then I add the ambient occlusion map on top with the blending mode in multiply. After that, I colorize the layer using its complementary color. I keep in mind my knowledge of color theory. There is plenty of information and resources about it in the internet. Time to add the other maps. I use the same method, trying all blending modes and colors and then deciding which one I like the most. After I do this with all my folders, I test how is it looking in Marmoset. I use Marmoset because I like that I can quickly make changes inside Photoshop that will instantly change in real time. I also adjust levels, curves, brightness, contrast, and any Photoshop tool that can seem helpful. I really enjoyed this step, so I just like to have fun and experiment. After I decide the result is close enough to the concept art, I can start painting. Step 7. Texture painting. At this point, I haven't started painting yet, so what I like to do next is to import my meshes into Blender and connect the base colors of the material to my baked maps. I color pick the baked maps color and then add saturation to make the texture more interesting. I also like to introduce new colors especially to rocks and things that require color variation. Finally, I ring up the highlights and corners by pushing up the value. This is the part that I have most fun with. I always have my references on a second screen and I keep coming back to them all the time. Step 8. Animation and effects. There are lots of ways to approach moving things inside an engine, but this time I chose to animate inside Maya and then loop the animations in Unity. I made a change of joints for the fishing rod and I used the motion path tool inside Maya to animate the fishes. It's a fairly simple procedure. I just drew a circle with the CV curve tool and then assign a time frame for the fish to complete the path. For the water, I used a Voronoid node inside Unity and then added movement with the time node. 
For more information about how to create VFX for games, check out Gabriela Aguiar's content. Step 9. Presentation I went for a cartoony style for this piece, so I don't have lighting interaction between surfaces. Most of my meshes have a non-lit material that is ignoring the light of the scene. However, I used the Unity Shader Graph to create a simple gradient that I used as a background and gave the plants a little movement with another shader using the time node and a gradient noise. I also animated the camera with the animation tool inside Unity. And that's it! I hope you liked this video and learned a few things by looking at my process. I want to thank Thomas and all the stylized station community for giving me the space to do so. See you next time!